you guys stand up on your feet? Amen. Amen. It's always good to be in the house of the Lord. Let's join in. Let's join in tonight, guys. Uh, I just want to say it's great to see the kids in the house of God. Amen. Us older seasoned saints, can you say amen? amen? It's good to have the kids here. Kids, you're always welcome here. But listen, when we're having worship service and whatever we're doing, let's honor and respect the Lord. Okay? And that means get involved in worship. Because if we're going to honor and respect him, we lift our hands, we clap our hands, but we don't cut up. And don't act crazy. Okay? Let's have some fun. Let, we can have fun while we worship the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, I felt like I needed to say that to this group. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, we do honor and respect you. God, we revere you. You are God. And Lord, we want to worship you tonight in spirit and in truth. Lord, we ask you to receive our praise. Lord, we ask that high praise would flow from House Victorious tonight directly to your throne room. And Lord, I thank you that your presence just hovers in here and moves throughout this place. But more than just being in the house, Lord, I thank you that you're in us. And I pray that you move through us in a mighty way today. Confirm in our hearts that you're in us and with us. Lord, even as you said, the kingdom of God is in you and among you. I pray, Lord God, that we would worship you as you are right here next to us because according to your words, you are. We give you all the praise tonight. Receive our worship. Receive our praise. In Jesus' name, if you agree, shout amen. amen. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Yeah. 
name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory. like you, Lord, in all the earth. Match us love and beauty in this world. Nothing in this world will satisfy. Jesus, you're the cup that won't run dry. Jesus, you're the cup that won't run dry.
my days on earth I will away. The moment that I see your face, your face, there's nothing in this world will satisfy. Jesus, you're the cup that won't run dry. Jesus, you're the cup that won't run dry. Your presence, your presence is heaven to me. Lord, your presence, your presence is heaven to me. Your presence, Lord.
Tim Boone once said that you never know that Jesus is all you need until he's all you have. You never know that Jesus is all you need until he's all you have. Take this whole world, but give me Jesus. And the world behind us, the cross before us. Uh, the Bible tells us, Jesus reminds us that in these last days, uh, because lawlessness abounds, the love of many grow cold. So that means in our day, in our hour, we need to have our love burn brighter and brighter and brighter. And not allow our love to wax cold. Father, we love you. We glorify you. Lord, we thank you for your presence that's here in this place. Jesus, we need you. We need you in this day and we need you in this hour, Lord God. We need you in our country. We need you in our state. We need you in our city. Lord God, we need you in this body, Lord. We need you in our homes. Most importantly, we need you in our lives. Lord God, we thank you that you poured your love, that you shed your love abroad in our hearts, Lord God, that we've been redeemed from the curse of the law. Lord God, that we now have, walk in the Spirit and we're free from the law of sin and death. Lord God, all we need is you. Lord, we look unto you, the author, the finisher, the perfecter of our faith. We look unto you, the one who's began a good work in us. Lord God, and we call upon you, and when we call upon you, we know that you answer. Lord, we call upon you to save our loved ones. Those that are far from you, draw them near, God. Lord God, uh, let hearts be softened. Lord God, let spirits of addiction and bondage be broken off now in Jesus' name. May the blinders come off. 
May deaf ears be opened, Lord God. May those who have walked with you before, Lord God, may they return home and walk with you again. Lord God, may they see the goodness of God in the land of the living, Lord God, because we have, we've tasted and we've seen that you are good and that you're good to your people. Lord, we love you, we honor you, and we honor you with our lives. In Jesus' name, and if you're in agreement with that, say amen, amen. You can be seated. Amen. My heart's desire for my entire time of walking with the Lord is to honor him with my life in everything, uh, what I say, what I do, um, and I fall far, far short of his standard. Uh, but I know this, that his grace is sufficient for me in my time of need. And just as Pastor Nate reminded us earlier in our weakness, his strength is perfected. Uh, that I've been crucified with Christ, and nevertheless, not I who lives, but Christ lives within me. And um, the closer I walk with Jesus, the more I want his love to shine forth. Uh, to be a living testimony. Uh, to be those living stones that are assembled, that are anointed, that are set in order. And as we're anointed stones set in order, uh, we know this, that we make up the house of God. And in that place, it's a thin place where angels ascend and descend. And uh, just, as, uh, just as it was for uh, uh, Jacob as he laid his head at Bethel and he set an altar before the Lord, uh, we make ourselves an altar before the Lord. Amen. And God speaks to his people. And God is real. Amen. And he changes not. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I'm not letting go of him because he's not letting go of me. Amen. If you didn't get a chance to give, there's plates in the back. Um, you want to give, give unto the Lord. You'll be blessed. Uh, give cheerfully. Give generously. Give obediently. Don't give out of compulsion. Uh, but when you give, give in faith and know that uh, um, he's the one that's called us to cast our bread upon the water. In many days, it'll return back to us. And uh, I've seen in my life and other people's lives the faithfulness of God as we've given unto the Lord time and time again. Hallelujah. And we want to continue in that. Um, next week, we got men's and women's meetings. Um, got a big month coming up with some graduations next month. It's going to be awesome. I think Pastor Nate said we got nine youth that are graduating this year. So uh, they're, having a, they're going to have a big flip and turnover uh, in the youth ministry. And uh, Isaiah is going to be joining youth group by the <laughs> by the end of May. <sighs> Hallelujah! Pray for him. Pray for Pastor Nate. I don't know. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Kiddos, you guys ready to roll back with me? All right, kiddos, you guys roll. And as the kiddos roll back with me, I'm going to have Pastor Pastor Jim come on up and bring the word, my friend. Did I miss him? Gives me strength from day. 
for it soothes my doubts and it calls all of my fears and that same blood it dries all of my tears oh the blood from day to day, it will never lose its power, and thank God it reaches to the high. You know that'll be sung at my funeral. Amen. But I think I'm going by way of the rapture. <laughs> How many of you know it's getting close? Amen. Amen. Am I on, Jordan? You good? <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, I'm going to be ministering next Sunday morning. And so I uh, wanted to go ahead and get into the anointing tonight, but I, I want to save it for next Sunday morning. So we're going we're gonna to talk about something else tonight. Is that all right? Amen. Amen. Nate hit it right on the head because the kingdom of God is within you, around you, among you. It's accessible. And we're going to kind of go through some things that will reinforce, encourage, and maybe even teach a few people. Amen. Hope everybody out there in cyberland is listening because I know some of you aren't here. So I hope you're listening at home. So you can be edified and be caught up with the rest of us that are here tonight. But if you have your Bibles, turn over to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. Or if you're taking notes, Luke 17, verse 21. I may go a little bit in front of it, but... Verse 20, we'll start there. And when he had demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Amen. The kingdom of God is within you. We're going to talk a little bit about how we know and why we know the kingdom of God is within us. And it's really important to understand this. As the Greek word calls us the ecclesia of God, amen, it gives a connotation. Uh, in fact, it was an old Roman term that was used of the Senate, and it spoke of governmental authority. And when the word ecclesia was given to the church, 
that was, the, that was something the Apostle Paul wanted us to understand. Even though we're located down here on this earth, there's a difference between uh, location and position as far as being Christians. My location is right here. And being a child of Adam, but now a child of God, gives me dual citizenship. Because the entrance into this earth lease is through a woman. Amen. Being born of a woman, that makes me a lawful citizen of the earth. And as a son or a daughter of Adam, we have a certain amount of authority. And Adam kind of gave that up, the earth lease up to the devil for everybody says about 6,000 years. It's going on 7,000 years. Okay, Jesus even, Jesus even said uh, when the devil came and took him you know, from the wilderness and said, hey, this whole earth is mine. If you'll bow down and, and uh, you know, worship me, I can, give, I can give you all the kingdoms of the earth in just a moment of time. See all that stuff you see? I can give it to you. Jesus didn't refute that though. He says, because it was given to me. How? Because God gave it to Adam, and when Adam bowed his knee to the devil, then the devil became his master. Okay. Now, understand and know that God still owns the earth. It's just like if you buy a house and you rent it out, it's still your house, but you leased it out to, to somebody for a period of time. And I know it's a little more complicated than that, but I'm just trying to make it simple. Satan wasn't lying when he said that this earth domain, he had, he had power and he had authority in it. And if you can't tell, look around and see what's going on. And you can see that he pretty much is able to, to manipulate and get, get what he wants seemingly for right now. And the reason of that is this. Listen, the reason for that is he has people's hearts. Amen. Difference between them and us is we've been born again and our heart has changed. And now we're connected to the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of God is within us because of the new birth and because Jesus lives in our heart. So you won't say low here or low there for the kingdom of God is within you. Now this is an important understanding to have because when you know your authority, when you know your God-given authority, that gives you a power that goes beyond Satan's power. Okay, And we'll get into more scripture here and I'll build upon this. Uh, if, you have, if you have your Bibles, turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. A very familiar scripture. Verse 17. <clears throat> this is just going to establish what I just said, only it's going to be through the scriptures. Remember, we're born again. Jesus said you must be born again. And there is a lawful entrance into this world. You know, Satan is here unlawfully. John 10.10 10 says the thief comes not but to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come that you might have life and life more abundantly. Satan was a thief. He, he basically stole what was, what was ours through Adam, amen? But through Jesus Christ, the second Adam, we got it back, if you're in him. And if you're in him, then the kingdom of God is within you. You could just think, that access point to what's supernatural and what is heavenly is in us through the new birth. And it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new cre creature. Some of the other, uh, some of them say creation, and that's true, okay? Some of the other uh, Bible interpretations say creation. But if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things passed away. Behold, all things have become new, and all things are of God who reconciled us unto himself by Jesus Christ and has given unto us a ministry of reconciliation. So when you think about that, we were separated from God, but through Christ in the new birth, we've been reconciled back to God. So it's, it's just like, like it was, and, and it will continue on until we get our new bodies, amen? And there's a new heaven and a new earth. But right now, that newness is in here. When you, when you get into uh, Ephesians chapter 2 and it talks about us being seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, on down in that chapter, it talks about a new, one new man in Christ. That wall of separation between Jew and Gentile in Christ is knocked down and we've become one new man. He's made of two people, one new humanity in Christ. 
It's all this craziness that it's this group and that group and this group and this. No, it's, we're one in Christ. Amen. And I, I think the church ha, has got a long ways to go to understand that. You know, we have all these variations of the church and, and we're, we're divided in stuff. But when we get to heaven, I'm telling you right now, we're all going to be Pentecostal. Just saying. <laughs> the original church was a Pentecostal church because it was born on what day? Pentecost. Now, I'm just being a little facetious here, but it is true. And it's not the denomination Pentecostal, but it's a spirit denomination. And some people have that aspect and understand it. Others don't. And I, once again, I'm not pushing the denomination. I'm just I'm being a little facetious there. But it was born on the day of Pentecost. Amen. And so anyway, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. We become one new humanity in Christ Jesus. I know our flesh looks the same as other people's flesh, but we're not the same in Christ. We are different, and we are connected by the Spirit to kingdom of heaven. I'm talking about the kingdom of God in heaven, not the kingdom under heaven. Okay? Right? So as the ecclesia... We are a part of the governing body of heaven. We have become ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Uh, if, if I go to another country because my country sent me over to an embassy, that embassy becomes a little piece of the United States, amen? I'm a citizen of the United States, but I'm here as a representative of the United States to do whatever ambassadors do. But I know what we do as ambassadors we are those that bring people to Jesus Christ and help them reconcile unto God. We've been given a ministry of reconciliation. I, see, when we get these things and really understand what the Bible is saying, I think it makes us a lot more powerful in the Lord. It makes us a lot more authoritative. It, it makes us have that, that understanding that when we face a devil or we face somebody that's under the influence of the devil, we don't have to back off one inch. We just have to walk in love. Walking in love isn't just letting people walk all over you either. Let me tell you right now. You know, if my mind is right and I see somebody that's oppressed by the devil and I go, look at them, man, they got devils. Oh, it used to ir irk me in the early days when people in the church would go, he's got a devil, she's got a devil. They got... and, and they're like, they're like being like a Pharisee going, look at me because I'm not saying this church, the church I used to go to, because I don't allow that stuff here. They got a devil, you know. That's weird. I think you got a devil if you're acting like that, because if they got a devil, you ought to have so much compassion for them. If God lets you discern that somebody's got a devil or they're oppressed, you should want, you should want nothing but to get them delivered, because you know what? I'm not allowed to hate people. I'm not allowed to hate people, but I can hate the devil. I don't have to love the devil. I can hate the devil. I hate what he does. He's a murderer. And all of his little demon cohorts that follow him around and do his bidding, they're, they're evil. They're murderers. Look what they're doing in the earth right now. So I can hate them, but boy, I can't hate people. I mean, even when people just make you angry and bug you, you still have to look at them, and it's difficult sometimes. You have to look at them through the eyes of God's love and believe that they can be different. See their potential. You know, the cool, the cool thing about, about being a, a naughty person before you met the Lord is you really can't look down your nose at anybody, can you? <laughs> You're like, well, you know, I used to be that guy or that girl, you know, whatever you were walking in. Amen? But I'm not like that anymore. And guess what? In Jesus' name, you can be reconciled back to God, and you don't have to be like that either. Can you say amen? And so, one new humanity in Christ. And, you know, we should, we should have joy when we have conflict with the enemy. Because Jesus said that if you know who he is, according to Matthew chapter 16 and verse 16 through 18... That the, he'll give you the keys of the kingdom of God and the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. We talked about keys not too long ago, amen? Jesus has the keys of death and hell, but he also, he also has the keys that will set people free. Amen. Praise God.
reconciled us back to God, connected us to the Holy Spirit. How special is that? Even tonight, you know, I, 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 people can do whatever they want. I don't want to be no kind of controlling pastor. Stay at home, watch YouTube, do whatever you feel like you can get away with with God. But I want to have church on Sunday night, such as it is. I want to have church on Wednesday night. I was raised up having church three times a week. Amen? And that's how I like it. In fact, my mother-in-law's church was always having revivals, such as they were. Amen? Sometimes we'd be in church every night of the week. And being a young Christian, I really dug it. Because we didn't have all these things to keep, uh, keep us busy and occupied and all that kind of thing. And I just wanted to be around the Spirit of God. I wanted to hear somebody that was anointed teaching me the Word of God. Or reminding me of something maybe I forgot. And it's important that we know who we are in Christ, Brother Gabe. It's important that we understand and know that we're just, we're just not some little beggars down here. You know how people try to classify you as a Christian. No, you're just one of them wacko, mega, weirdo, conservative, crazy people or you know some kind of thing like that. No, I'm a child of the Most High God. And, and even though I'm not going to pop my chest out to you, you should be glad that I'm here. See, now we're not going to tell them that, but you and I need to know that. Not for a point of arrogance or pride, but we need to understand and know how important we really are to God. Because when we got born again, if we weren't needed down here, God loves us so much, he'd have snatched us up. You'd have got saved, got born again, filled with the Holy Ghost, and God would have just, well, I'm taking you home because you don't need to be here no more. But we need to be here. And we're the occupation. We're the ambassadors for Jesus Christ. And if we keep that mindset about us, I mean, I know you can't do it 24-7, but you ought to stop and meditate once in a while and think about it when you go to a store, when you go to, to work. Bless God, I'm an embassy. I'm a movable tabernacle that God walks in. Man, it's, you, this, is, this is special that you're a born-again child of God, that God called you out of a greater body of people that are lost, and he brought you to himself, however he did it. It's a special thing. Oh, uh, you know, I was raised in church, and man, you know, my parents were really fanatic. Thank God. Thank God. I mean, I'm not talking about the crazy fanatics, but the people that actually wanted to be with Jesus and his people. There's nothing better, nothing higher than to be a child of the Most High God. You should feel, I mean, the right kind of proud about that. I am a child of the Most High God. I am a king's kid. Boy, you know, back in the day when I felt like I was nobody and nothing, and God snatched me out of the world and, and brought me into his kingdom and gave me a ministry, amen? He gave you a ministry too. It's not all up here, folks. But he gave me a ministry. He gave me a standing in the kingdom. I mean, I, I can't tell you when I first started getting Revelation how awesome it was to know that all those years when I wasn't living and walking with God, that inside of me I felt there was something special, not that I was specialer than anybody, but I, I had this connection. God was always like calling me. And it bugged me sometimes, but he was calling me to fellowship. And I believe he's doing it to, you know, everybody out there. Some just are more sensitive. But it's special that I'm a child of God. It's not a drudge that I'm a minister of the gospel. It, it, it is a special calling. Amen? Hallelujah. And sometimes we forget that. We get so caught up in what's going on that we forget. You know what? My home is, is in heaven, and I'm going there pretty soon. And then when we're done up there for the seven years while tribulation's going on, I'm coming back with Jesus and I'm going to help establish a thousand year millennial reign of Jesus Christ, the second man, Adam, who's going to come to this earth and he's going to rule the earth the way Adam should have done it. You say, well, why do we have a thousand year reign? Because he wants to show, because there's going to be people that come into the kingdom that aren't born again the way we are. Jews and Gentiles alike, the nations and people that are left over after all the craziness that goes on during that seven year, they're going to come into the kingdom. Sin is going to be taken away because every demon, every devil, and the devil is going to be locked in the bottomless pit. And sins, the sin factor, even though those that are still Adamites, 
they will still have the sin factor in them because they're not born again, but it'll be put to, to rest. And, and we're going to be a kingdom of priests to our Lord. We're going to be down here. You know, everybody thinks we're just going to be floating. We can't enjoy the earth anymore because we're too above all that. We're going to be down here. Uh, we're a new creation reality, but we're going to be ministering. The job that the angels have been doing, we're going to be doing a lot of that ourselves. I'm not saying we're going to be angels, okay? That's not what it is. Well, we're going to be like Him, like our Lord. Only we can't, we can't have the top tier. We get the, we get the others, right? I'm good enough for that, right? Think about this. This is not a fairy tale. This is reality that's, that's going to come to pass. I mean, we believe our word, and we believe that's... So while we're here, and like I, I talked to my sister back there, and I was telling her, you know, man, for the last two weeks, uh, it's just I've had this anxious feeling. Because, well, you know, everything that's going on in the world would do it, but it's even been more than that. It's like I'm discerning what the principalities and powers are really slinging out. And if our eyes were opened, I think we'd be freaked out. And so we can either sit around and, and, and we can determine, okay, am I having anxiety or a burden because of something not going right as far as mechanical things in my life or money? Or am I having a burden and I feeling anxiety because of the war that's going on in the heavenlies? And as a kingdom agent down here on this earth, we're going to see something here in a minute. We're reconciled back to God. Listen, let's go through Ephesians chapter 1 again. Go over to Ephesians 1. Now I'm going to connect that. You might think I just hung it out there, but I'm going to connect that. It's going to take a, a few scriptures, though, to get there. Are you with me? We need to be encouraged tonight. You need to say to yourself, when things are going bad, well, you know what? I'm a child of the Most High God. And this earth is against me because Jesus said it would be against me. I don't know why things are not working right on, on my job or with people and why sometimes people just seem to turn again. Well, go figure, they got the devil pushing on them. And that devil that's working through them wants to work on you and stop you. But that person is crying out on the inner side going, please be real, please be somebody that can deliver me. I'm tormented and I'm acting this way because of what the devil has done to me when I was a child. What the devil has done to me because of life. And I can't find my way out of this. So I'm angry. I'm reacting. Does that make sense? I feel guilty. See, I'm under the spirit right now. But I ain't, I ain't going to lie to you and tell you that I do this perfectly. Because I'd be a liar if I did. But when the Holy Spirit, if we get in the spirit... We'll be able to put things in perspective a lot better. Because when the anointing's on us, and we're going to finish talking about that this coming Sunday morning, we're going to talk, uh, Lord willing anyway. Uh, but, but when the anointing of God is upon us, it compels us. The love of God compels us, constrains us. It's like Pastor Craig was saying this morning, you know, he's grouchy and some lady gets nasty and gets in his face for no reason. And the, the natural man wants to go, what's up your craw, lady? Why don't you just back off, you know, or something, you know. When you don't know that two other people probably talked, you know, put her down, gave her a bunch of junk. Amen? Have you ever thought about that sometimes when people are like that? They might have just had three or four people just trash them, and they're like, I ain't putting up with no nonsense right now. <laughs> and you're the one that gets it. Amen. Ephesians 1, verse 11. In Christ, in whom we have obtained an inheritance. This is so important. That inheritance makes us ambassadors. It gives us anointing, yoke-breaking anointing. It gives us a ministry, a ministry of reconciliation, and besides all the things that pertain to life and godliness. Make sense? Being predestinated. I want you to understand, in predestination... In the heart and mind of God, he predestined everybody that would come to him to this blessing. He knew that not everybody would, but I want you to know, he did not predestinate some people to go to hell and some people to go to heaven. People choose. He, he will not violate your choice. If you're bound and determined to do what you want to do, God will let you do it. Well, he'll try really hard to keep you from it. He'll rescue you many times. But if you're bound and determined, if a person's bound and determined to go to hell, they're going to go to hell. God doesn't need to send you to hell. 
He's, he's given every man a choice. And it's written in your heart. Even if your head doesn't really know it or you haven't really been taught it, it's in your heart. Amen? Uh, God is crying out to every human being, and He has predestined them to go to heaven if they receive His Son, Jesus. If not, they're predestined to go to hell. But it's their choice. Amen? And you say, well, what about all the people that... You know what? Don't go there. Just preach the gospel and let God worry about the, the you know, the... Uh, the aborigines over in some strange country, okay? Let, let him worry about those. You think he can't save them? If, if we don't make it to him, by golly, the, in the 1040 window, the Lord himself is appearing to Muslims and getting them saved. And then they're going and getting other people saved. So he could, he could go somewhere where, you know, man has not really tread with the cannibals somewhere. And one of them can get a vision or a dream and Jesus can come and talk to them and they could save their whole tribe. Seriously, if, if we can't get there, God will give a way. There will be a way, all right? He is a just and righteous God. I'm not going to make up things, though, and go, well, you know, God will just forgive them because they're just, you know, aborigines somewhere that don't know anything running around a loincloth. I don't know how he'll do it, but if I can't get there, you can't get there, God will do something because he's a just God. Amen? Hallelujah. And so, in whom we've attained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose. According to purpose. You've got to get into God's purpose, church. It's not your purpose. It's God's purpose. Too many people are accepting Christ for their purpose. And I know sometimes that, that's what brings us to the Lord, the fear or a problem, and our purpose is to get out of that problem. But after you get past that, it's God's purpose, not yours. It's God's will, not ours. Amen? Does that make sense? According to the counsel of His own will. Not my will, but thine be done. You know, uh, that was the biggest problem with Lucifer. I will, I will, I will. I'll do this, I'll do that, I'll sit on the sides. Of the... I'll be like the Most High. No. It can't be your will. Jesus never allowed anybody to follow him on their terms. If, if he invited you to follow him in the days he was walking the earth, but you had excuses, he says, well, go let the dead bury the dead and you follow me. That's pretty harsh, really. I just lost uh, another one of my neighbors. We lost uh, uh, a neighbor uh, on, on the right side of our house who was like an auntie to my, my girls. Kathy Garcia just loved my daughters like they were, they, they were her nieces. And then their surrogate grandmother, Irma Rucker, on the other side passed away uh, last Sunday. And man, I'm telling you, you want to talk about feeling sad and losing two good neighbors. I'm not talking about, I wish my neighbor would just leave me. These were good neighbors, you know. And, uh, but, but, you know, I know that both of them knew the Lord. Amen. And, uh, but still, I'm sad. I'm sad because it's good to have good neighbors, isn't it? So now I don't know what's going to move in next to me, but you know what? I'm praying that there'll be people that if they're not Christians, they're receptive to, to us as Christians. Amen? Uh, hallelujah. Can you do that? Yeah, you can. But they may be hellions when they first move in. You never know. I mean, I was backslidden when I first moved over there, and Jack and Irma and them were, were gracious to us. And we always, whenever the, the sirens would go off, we'd all run out of the house and go over to Jack and Irma's because they had a basement. So they'd just leave their house unlocked even when they went on vacation in case the weather turned bad so we could go over there and get in there, if you can imagine that. These are old school people, right? Those are the kind of neighbors you like. Anyway, just saying, just a little deviation. I'm so glad, Irma, you're up there with Jack walking with him right now and your daughter, and good for you and Kathy. You're not sick anymore and your liver's not giving you trouble anymore. You're with Jesus. Amen? So, verse 12. That we should be to the praise of His glory. You know, instead of people sitting there begging on the church and the people of the church because you got a lot of money-grubbing pastors and prophets out there not doing what's right. Well, are you their judge? No, I'm trying my hardest not to judge. And I don't name names, but I can see the fruit. 
And some of them, in my opinion, were really great ministers in the past, but somewhere they got off track. I'm telling you, it is easy to get off track if you're not careful, especially if you get into the money thing. It's really difficult. Money, the, you know, the love of money, the Bible says, is the root of all evil. Money's not evil, but the root uh, uh, where you're just lusting after it, and it's a scary thing. I'm telling you, if you think it's easy to be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ and, and to keep yourself clean from the things that the enemy throws at you and the temptations, you got another thing coming. Well, you ought to know because you're ministers too. you got to keep yourself pure. And we want to be to the praise of his glory who first trusted Christ. Verse 13, in whom also you trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel or the good news of your salvation, in whom also after you believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. What's the promise? We got the promise of heaven. We got the promise of eternal life with Almighty God. And we got one glorified body on account right now. This, this vehicle served me well, but I'm telling you, it's getting a little creaky lately. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's not tracking the way it used to down the road anymore, amen? I can't even do some of the things I used to do 15, even 10 years ago. Man, and some of that's just because I've been sitting on my duff a lot. But just saying, you know, you, you can't stay... 30 years old your whole life. That would really be cool, wouldn't it? Not in this body, but I'm going to tell you, when I get my new body, I'm going to be like the Lord because I'm going to see Him like He is. I mean, not from the time of 30 all the way to, I think, 50, I was the strongest I've ever been in my life. Amen. So just imagine with a, with a supercharged body what we're going to be like. Oh, man, I can't wait. I tell you this, if, the, if this is possible... When I get to heaven, I know they got hills and mountains there. I'm going to run as fast as I can up that hill. Because when I was young, I, I could run like the wind. I'm serious. And, and I could swim all day long in the ocean and not hardly get burned out at all. And I, I, I have dreams. I don't know if you do, Nate. I have dreams where I can still run like I used to run. I'm, in my dreams, I'm always somewhere about 30, 35 years old. Cool, isn't it? But then I wake up. <laughs> Hallelujah. But someday, my brother, yeah, I'm going to be tall also. You get to be short, I'm going to be tall. All the tall people in heaven have to be short. And us little short guys, we all get some extra height. If I was God. But I'm not. Aren't you glad? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Bald headed and with an old Santa Claus beard, right? Now, I don't think so. Jesus changed his appearance. I'm going to put mine back like it used to be. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Luke 10, 20 in the NLT. Let me read this. But do not rejoice because evil spirits are subject to you, but rejoice because your names are registered in heaven. That's Luke 10, 20. Uh, when the 70 went out and Jesus anointed them and gave them authority and power and they went out and they were doing the works of Christ. Amen. They were laying hands on people and they were, they were recovering from their sicknesses. Evil spirits were going out of them. And they were like, woohoo, man. I mean, it is pretty woohoo when, when God works through you and somebody gets healed or somebody gets delivered. Can you say amen? Or somebody gets born again, that's the ultimate to me. When, somebody, when I get to pray the sinner's prayer with somebody, that's the best thing in the world. And the second best thing, and not really second or whatever, but I'm just saying it that way. It's when I lay hands on somebody and they, and they begin to get the Holy Ghost and speak in tongues without me trying to coach them. Come on now. You know, they just get the Holy Spirit. I mean, there's been people that I thought, okay, I'm going to have to talk them through this. And I lay my hands on them, immediately they start praying in tongues. I'm like, whoa, that's cool. That's cool. You know what? Because that reinforces what I believe and what I do. And it happens so quick. That's why some of you heard the story about Pastor Al years and years ago, a Catholic boy coming into the church. You know, I'm, I'm working on this other young lady that was in there that, that I was going to do their wedding. And you heard pastors say, we don't usually marry two un, 
an unbeliever with a believer. Of course, they already had one kid, so I would have probably done it anyway just because of that kid. But I'm like, don't want to break that. That's how I believed, especially back then. And so I was like preaching right at her, you know. And so I gave an altar call and her hand went up, but Al's went up quicker than hers. I wasn't even, I didn't even think he was ready to get saved, but man, something, something got a hold of him called the Holy Ghost. Amen. And he got saved. The next week I'm praying for him and got my eyes closed. And you know how you're supposed to fall backwards, right? <laughs> Pastor Al, all of a sudden I see this shadow coming at me and I move just in time and he goes, bam, on the floor. I think he might have even bounced. I don't know. We had some hard floors over there on that 26th Street. Uh, he'd, never seen, he'd never seen anybody fall under the power. I heard a pastor say the other day, all that falling under the power ain't real. I know there's a lot of people that fake it, but I got to tell you, I've seen some folks. Uh, we used to have hard oak pews at my mother-in-law's church, and Sandy Hal's mother one time fell out under the power I was in the pew behind her, and she fell out under the power and hit her head on that oak pew. And it sounded like a watermelon smacking it. I thought, oh, my goodness. And it was, I was new to all this. And I thought, this poor woman is going to have a problem. Well, after she finally got up off the floor, I go, didn't that hurt? She goes, what? I never felt nothing. Uh, one time, uh, I, think, I think it was Pastor Kelly. My, he was praying for me one time. I was over at the old church. And the power of God hit me, and I kind of flew back a little bit. And, and when, as I was starting to go down, somebody grabbed my wrist. Well, I hit the pew, and I hit the floor. I never felt that. What I felt was the person grabbing my wrist because they grabbed me. And that's the only thing that hurt. My back and my head didn't hurt because when you really go out under the power, but I don't, you know, I don't like to let older people especially go out under the power without catching them or because you never know they might not really be in the spirit you know amen uh glory to god but i believe in it because i've seen it and i know there's people that fake it and there's just people that do it because they think that's what they're supposed to do but i'm telling you i've seen some people go down under the power that that wouldn't have went down under the power unless god actually did it and then they were tripping because they went out under the power and they thought nobody's ever put me on the floor before remember james remember james huh yeah that's right you, you remember that he was upset man big old boy strong muscle he goes nobody put me on the ground i go i didn't put you on the ground dude i didn't, I didn't push i didn't because i you'll know i never push you and, and uh he went out he, he was upset because nobody puts me on the ground i'm like well, God does. <laughs> Thought we was going to have trouble. But when it's real, it's real, right? Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's see. Let's go on to Ephesians chapter 2. Did I already read this? Ephesians 2 and verse 4. But God. Everybody say, but God. But God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath he quickened or made us alive with Christ Jesus, for by grace you're saved. And he has, listen, listen, once again, this is something that we need to see as special. Because, you know, walking through the earth, you know, we're, we're fat, we're skinny, we're short, we're tall, you know, whatever, long hair, short hair, no hair. And, and, and sometimes we just don't feel like we're special. You know, and, and like I've said so many times, a lot of times we look up here and we think this is the only thing in church. This is not. It is a privilege to be a part of the kingdom of God. It is a privilege to be born again. Amen. But to be raised up. Now, remember, I said at the beginning, there's a difference between location and position. And this is important because as we get older, my location is more on my um, uh, what, what do you call it? Recliner. <laughs> I like my recliner. Amen. I'm not doing the things I used to do when I was younger as much. Amen. In fact, not too much of it. But that doesn't negate my ability to affect the kingdom of God for Jesus Christ down here on this earth. Um, 
Now, some of you may know this better than I do, okay? So I'm not going to try and act like I'm the scientific brain. How many of you have ever heard of quantum theory before? Okay. How many of you ever heard of quantum entanglement? It's where you can take these things that are called quantum on the, the, the micro, I mean, below micro. I mean, we're talking to the, the very depths of, of time and space. And if you quantumly entangle a particle, you can take that particle and its locale, one piece can be here on the Earth, and you could send the other one clear out to Alpha Centauri, and that one out there in Alpha Centauri and the one here that have been entangled, they know what each one is doing. They are still connected together. Okay, it kind of blows your mind. Do you understand that to a degree? That's how it is for us right now. Because we're quantumly, even more, spiritually entangled with the Lord Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. For one, by one spirit, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13 says, are we baptized in the body of Christ? That even connects us to each other. We're quantumly or spiritually entangled with the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and our locale may be here, but we're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Look what it says. And has raised us up together, verse 6, and has made us to sit in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. So God has given us positional authority in heaven that gives us location on this earth and the ability to pray God's will in accordance with his word right here on this earth. Why? Because not only were we a son or daughter of Adam, which gave us legal right to be here on this earth, but when Jesus Christ came, see, the devil may have the Adamic earth lease, but Jesus Christ took it away from him and gave it to his kids. He allows this, this part of the kingdom to go on because he has to save people out of this kingdom and bring them over here. That's why he's letting it go on. Otherwise, he'd just stop it. But if he stops it, when he stops it, and he's getting ready to, all these people are lost. His grace, if Jesus doesn't come and take us out of here in the next year, two years, three years, ten years, twenty years, I don't know that it'll go that far. But like I was telling my sister back there, back in 1975, right before Lori and I got married, I, I was thinking, we need to hurry up and get married and have a couple kids because I didn't think we'd probably be around enough to have kids and I wanted to experience being married and having kids, right? Here we are, you know, years later, 48 years later, <laughs> and, and we've got five grandchildren and five kids, right? So we don't know, even though we're feeling it right now, we don't know that the grace of God will not give us a window. And if he does, it's not just so we can go uh, do everything that we want to do according to our own lust. It's because he's left us here because he's, his heart wants to reach more of the lost. Well, he's, he's ordained that we be ministers of reconciliation. Now, I know I said that the Lord could, is visiting people in countries. There are countries where we can't get in, where they kill you. You know, um, when I was with the International Pentecostal Holiness Church, they got to where they wouldn't even tell you what the names of their ministers were uh, and sometimes where they were serving at in case the enemy, you know, the, the Muslims and people that hate Christians would find out, get them and kill them. Because some of them were co covertly there. Some of them were people that had gotten born again from other ministries and was there in their own place. Ministry. You don't understand the freedom we got here. We can walk in here and talk and goof around, watch our kids run through the church. and That's all good because you know what? Uh, God has blessed us with that ability. But it's not that way in China. It's not that way in some African countries. It's not that way in Muslim countries. Amen. It's just not that way in a lot of places. They have to hide. I remember when Pastor Kelly and I were, were uh, you know, partners in this thing, and he went to, um, what was that? No, it was Hungary, wasn't it? They wouldn't even let Christians in Romania back in them days. Ceausescu, no way, man. He'd hang you there. But it was Hungary, and when he got off the plane, they had machine guns. And 
they had to be secretive about going to a church there. And it was an underground church for real, you know. And the secret police were always trying to infiltrate those places. You know, when I went on my trip, I got to go to Sweden. <laughs> Oops, all of Sweden. I, I was so glad that God didn't have me go to Hungary because it sounded pretty scary to me. You know, Sweden was, no, was a piece of cake back in them days. Amen. But uh, that's the way it is in some countries. And you all know that. But I'm just saying, sometimes we need to stop and think about that. How blessed we are. We're so blessed. Amen. And we're blessed to live in America even as it is right now. Because you know what? If the grace of God wills it, it can be turned around for a season. It won't stay that way forever because the Bible already says how things are going to go. Not just in other countries, but right here. And we can see right now, and maybe we'll wake up if we get some grace for a while and we'll straighten up as American people. But, you know, my thoughts are some bad stuff's got to happen in order to bring people to their knees. And that, it kind of stinks for us because the rain falls on the just and the unjust. We've already went to our knees. Lord, get the people that don't, you know, but that's not how it works. We'll suffer right along with them. And it isn't because that's God's perfect will. It's just the will of the people versus the will of God. And if you're in a, in a place where the majority of people's hearts are turned toward the evil one, because remember what we, we, we can't cast out principalities. We have to displace them one heart at a time. Okay? And that's our job. So, you know, when the church starts whining because of this or that, uh, they just need to look in the mirror. How many hearts are you reaching? How many seeds are you planting? All right? God's given us positional authority. And by that, on this earth, we can be ambassadors, reconciliators for God, and we have authority as ad Adamite part of our body. That's the thing that gives us the Adamite authority. But our spirit gives us that overcoming victorious, seated in heavenly places thing. Okay? All right. Still with me? Let me read a scripture in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. Here's the cool thing. This is another thing that you and I have when we're, when we're doing what we're supposed to do for the Lord and we're going through some things, okay? We need to think about this. Verse 15 of Hebrews 4 says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, our weaknesses, our pains, amen, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Oh, Jesus was God. He didn't, he didn't. His flesh... His flesh that came from Mary was capable of being tempted. You say, well, what was he? Well, it says in all points. Do I need to make a list? I'm not going to make a list. Whatever he got tempted in, it was enough. But he resisted it and he never sinned. For he was made to be sin, who knew no sin, that we might become the very righteousness of God through him. Vicariously, he took our sin and the handwriting of ordinances upon his cross with him. Amen? And, and that, in that he overcame, this is why you should rejoice, because in the law, I could never do it. You could never do it. Nobody's ever been able to. The best person you could. Sister Goody Two-Shoes would screw up somewhere. Maybe just using that slang word right there. But I'm just saying. I'm saying. But. I have imputed righteousness that's independent of what I do, but it's because of who I know. So does that mean I can take the grace of God to lasciviousness? No. Because of that grace, I'm an overcomer. And I do my best to walk in that grace. And when I make a mistake, I got 1 John 1, 9. And I've got a Savior whose blood never loses its power. And so he says, because of this, verse 16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Now, I've talked uh, many times before about some people uh, that I think are really special. No more special than anybody, but, but their stories really stand out and get me right here. 
And, you know, I've talked about Anna and Simeon and their devoutness to the Lord. And because of their devoutness, not because they were any better than anybody else, but because of their devoutness and their desire to seek the Lord, just like Enoch walking with God. There are certain people that want God more than they want their flesh. They want to experience God. And uh, we're not the only ones. We're not unique to that fact. There's a lot of people. But in Acts chapter 10 and verse 1, and I'll just read this. You don't need to go over there. I'm just going to kind of go through it real quick. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius. Now, you know I like this story because I talk about it a lot because it really impresses me. A centurion of the band called the Italian band. So he's a Roman occupier uh, of, of Jerusalem. But he was a devout man. What does it mean to be devout? It means that when you are uh, serious about something, you take it seriously. If you love the Lord, your devoutness is you're serious about your, your lifestyle. You're serious about your devotion. You're devout about it. It's, not, it's like, you know, some people go, well, we just come to church every week and nothing really exciting. Now, I'm devout in my church attendance. It's not all about what I see or feel or, you know, if there's something super exciting happening. Because a lot of times it's just, it's just wax on, wax off, one foot in front of the other. Day by day, I live my life with Jesus. It doesn't always have to be so spectacular. When you have these churches where everything is always spectacular, every, every week there's got to be something spectacular. Now, I know in a bigger church, a lot of times it is spectacular because more people are getting saved because there's thousands in there maybe. But sometimes in a local church like ours, a family church, stuff is just you come to church, you worship God, you listen to the message, you pray, you go home and you live your Christian life. And you think, well, that's just kind of boring. Well, get off that trip. There's other things you can get excited about. And if you think we're boring, get out there and be unboring. I, I promise you, if you haul the cross down, down the street, it'll, it won't be boring. Go do that. Next time Cindy wants to go carry a cross, go tell her I'll help you carry it. I'll be, what was the, what was the guy's name that, that helped? Je yeah, I'll be him for, for a piece, you know. Or, or go, go, go find a bunch of young people and go witness to them. See how that goes over. You better go there with love. Because this group of people, they, they're going to challenge you. I mean, they did challenge us back in my wife and I's day when we'd go knock on doors and go down to the, to the beach and, and things, you know. And a lot of times you don't see anything happen. But what about that guy that, that, that preached to me down at the beach and I was with my friends, so I thought I'd be a little smart, Alec. And I crumpled up the track that he had and laughed at him. And I wasn't laughing on the inside, trust me. That bothered me the whole day, even though I was being a smart aleck in front of my friends. Man, I'm telling you, that word of God went inside of me like a BB in a barrel, and it was bouncing all around. And I laid my head down at night, and I was telling God, I'm sorry for being a smart aleck to, to one of your servants, because I did have respect for God, and I wished I would have not acted like that. Well, that guy might have got his feelings hurt. I've had people throw tracks back in my face, cuss me out, and it made me want to cry because I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm trying to help you, right? And I can imagine that guy might have felt really bad. And, and maybe it was his first time witnessing. I don't know. But you know what? He might not know it, but he'll know it in heaven one of these days when, when I remember him or, you know, because right now I can't even think of his face, but I remember the incident. And, and, and I go, thank you. I became a minister and I began to preach the gospel. There's people's lives that we've influenced that we may never even know what, what becomes of them. I mean, even some of my old friends that I don't know anymore, that I witnessed to before I separated from them. I, I haven't talked with them for 40-some years. I don't know what they've done. I don't know whether they got born again because of us or not. Amen? Hallelujah. And so this man of Caesarea Cornelius, you know, of the Italian band, a devout man, one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He wasn't praying like we're praying. He was trying to pray like the Jews prayed. He watched them. And he's like, I want what they got. And so even in his, his immaturity or infancy of doing his best to seek God, God's like, well, there's a new way now. There's a better way. And and how can I let this person who wants to get to know me just fall by the wayside? I've got to figure out a way to get him in the flock. 
because he's devout the way he is now. <clears throat> and my Jewish people at that point haven't went to the Gentiles yet, haven't let them know that they can come into the flock. And here's a Gentile that wants to come in. You know what? I'm going to start another, I'm going to start another day of Pentecost right here. And he, he sent that angel. And listen to what the angel said to him. This, this ought to get you when you pray, okay? All right? And so a devout man, one that feared God with all his house, gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked up, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms have come up for a memorial before God. This is a sinner, brother Gabe. What's, what's going on when we pray? Our locale is here, but our position is in heaven, right? Seated on the right hand of the Father with Jesus. Positionally, we are attached to heaven, quantumly, spiritually attached there. Our locale may be here, but we are attached by the Spirit there. And that means in the ecclesia of God, the governmental authority of God as ambassadors, that power, you heard Pastor quote something from one of my old sermons tonight. The house of God, the gate of heaven. Amen? The ladder that Jacob's ladder that climbed up, so-called he saw the angels ascending and ascending, where anointed stones, living stones. The Bible says in Peter, we are living stones. And when, where we're anointed and set up the way that the church is to be organized, according to the Bible, and we're worshiping God in that place, is the house of God, and it becomes a gate of heaven. That means that blessings from heaven and, and prayers from the earth come up and go down. Probably didn't do that right, but anyway. You get what I'm saying. Think about that. The Lord's Prayer, 11, 20, uh, Luke 11, 2 through 4. Listen to this. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. And he said unto them, when you pray, say. Not think, pray, say. Okay, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. This is the key when you're praying. Okay? Uh, God has a will for you to be blessed, to have finances, to have things that are, are according to life and godliness, okay? But when I'm praying for the earth, I need to know the will of God for the earth. It's all in His Word, okay? And He can fine-tune it, too. He can clue you into, I want you to be praying for this situation over here, you know. He'll tell you what to do. If you're a servant of God and you've made yourself a devout person who prays always, who's always seeking God's will for whatever part of occupation you're a part of. Okay, we're to occupy till he comes. So he says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so on earth. Not on, you know, a lot of times we say on earth as it is in heaven. Well, that's not bad, but think about it. As it is in heaven, because when we talk about binding and loosing, the, the connotation in the Greek is whatever is declared lawful in heaven for the earth is what we pray. And when we pray it like that, then God will move. Uh, what if he don't do it exactly like I want? He's God. Let him do what he wants. You're, you're just supposed to pray, and it opens a door for, for those blessings to come down here. We become gates. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Not only is our church a gate church, but you become a gate. You become a door. Because of your connectivity to heaven, you can bring heaven to earth. What do you mean? You mean golden streets and everything? No, I'm talking about will of God, the blessing of God, amen, the grace of God, reconciliation, uh, miracles. Are you following me? We're almost done. Hang in there with me. All right? So when I'm praying under the authority, quantumly, spiritually entangled with Christ who's seated on the right hand of God, because if you'll go back and study uh, Ephesians 1 and also Ephesians 2, you'll find out that we have, as the body of Christ, authority over the principalities and powers, mights and dominions, just like Jesus does. Because he bequeathed that authority to us. Okay? No, we're not Christ, but together, we as the body of Christ have the fullness of God. Individually, we have a portion. But together, we're better. 
We're stronger together. That's why if any two of you agree as to touching anything on this earth, it'll be done for us by our Father which is in heaven. The prayer of agreement is so powerful. All right, if you will, go over to Ezekiel 22, and we got two, two more portions of Scripture, and then we'll be finished. Okay, Ezekiel 22, and we're going to start at verse 23. I know this is Old Testament, but pastor said it tonight, and I'm going to agree with him. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? Yeah. You there? Ezekiel 22. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto her. Now, we know this is about Israel, but this applies. You'll see it applies to where we're at today. Say unto her, America. Uh-huh. Thou art the land that is not cleansed nor rained upon in the day of indignation. Because uh, of the fact that you've left me, you're not getting rain in indignation. You're just getting indignation, right? There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion ravening, ravening the prey. They have devoured souls. They have taken the treasure and precious things. They have made her many widows in the midst thereof. Taking advantage of widows, so-called prophets. And, and, you know, when they're saying prophets in the Old Testament, it can mean preachers, evangelists. It can, it can mean a lot of people that have gotten off into the money thing. And this is coming out real strong, but I'm telling you, the same stuff that went on in the old days goes on today, and people justify it and think that they're all right doing it and try to teach others to do it, Okay? There is a conspiracy of her prophets in their midst, thereof like a roaring lion ravening the prey. They have devoured souls. They have taken the treasure and the precious things. They have made her many widows in the midst thereof. Her priests have violated my laws and have profaned my holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and the profane. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean and have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths. And I am profaned among them. I got on a brother the other day on, on social media who's exposing every preacher who's wrong sin. And you know, I kind of agree with him that some of them that he's calling out is in sin. But me and him got into a little bit of a discussion. And, and he goes, well, you, I, you, you must not care what they're doing and how they're doing this and that and the other. And I said, you're assuming I don't care. I said, I've been a pastor for 35 years and I've tried my best to preach the word the best I know how and walk in integrity. So, you know, he's, he's assuming that I'm, I don't care because I don't do what he's doing. But what I told him, I said, you know, the, my problem is that you're calling this out before the world forum. If, if it was just Christians that are watching your show, then I'm cool with you, uh, you know, calling people out and showing their sin. But when it's in front of people and backsliders who don't want to go to church because the church is goofed up and it gives them a reason to stay away from the body of Christ. I'm justified not going to church because a bunch of hypocrites there. Well, you're the biggest hypocrite. You know that, right? And, and I was bugged by it. Now, I don't know that he's completely wrong about everything. But to me, when I think of the, what the Bible taught in the Old Testament, and David was already anointed king, the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and went on to David, and David still didn't take Saul out, even when he had him in the cave, and he could have killed him right there on the spot because Saul was trying to kill him. He cut a little corner off of his, uh, off his garment, and Saul didn't even know it, and he was going to go, ha, 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 I could have killed you, King Saul. You're chasing me for no reason. I'm on your side. And then he repented like crazy. How dare me touch the anointed of God? Well, he, God had already removed the spirit from him. But God hadn't removed King Saul. It's not up to me and you to remove all these people that we think are bad. Because God may, may restore them. You know? Well, I'm calling them out, so God... I, I, maybe I'm wrong. Do you think I'm wrong? I mean, I don't like what a lot of them are doing. I'm just calling it out there. But do you hear me call names? And not that many people watch our thing. I'm not trying to judge them. I, I see their fruit and I don't like it. Some of them I used to follow real close and I learned a lot from a lot of them. But they've gotten off track, you know. But it isn't my job to go and splatter them all over the world and go, so that the world can go, see, why should I go to church? These people are goofed up. 
I, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong, but, but I, I, that's how I feel about it. You know, let God deal with them. God can take them down and, you know, put, bring them back up. And some people, you never know, you know, there, were, there was a, oh, I know I'm going long. Is this okay? There was a man a long time ago that was a false prophet. The minute I walked into the church, I was a baby prophet, baby Christian. I walked into the church, and here's this guy teaching intercession. And I walked in, and I heard in my, my spirit, he's a false prophet. And I immediately felt bad. Oh, God, forgive me for, for thinking an evil thought like that against your servant. And later on, he, you know, I was a baby at the time. And he'd come up to me and he'd stare you in the eyes like, real spooky, man, like looking at all your sin and stuff. And you'd be like, you know, because you've seen him operate in the spirit or seemingly. And he had you convinced that he was the spooky wooky dude, right, with, discerning of spirits and i want to tell you i got discerning of spirits and i hear the word of knowledge word of wisdom and, and i don't know everything about you i hardly get a word from god about you unless unless god shows me and when he does it's not for me to be like let me examine you most of the time it's for me to pray and never to tell anybody about it That's right. right or if the lord says go you go tell them this and that and do you know how often God does it? How many times? How many of you have had me come to you and tell you thus and so to correct you? Is there anybody in here? Maybe Nate once. <laughs> he, he deserved it too. <laughs> do you see what I'm saying? And I am a prophet of God, a real one. Okay? And, and I'll say that. I don't even like saying it, but I'll say it. And that's why I know when some of these people act like prophets, they're really not prophets. They've read a book. And somebody told them they were one. God told me, and he, he confirmed it with visions and dreams. Some I've never even told you people about. Some I've told you once or twice. Because you know what? I don't want you thinking more of me than what you should. He's the one I want to point you to. And the prophetic gifts and the, the, the gifts of the Spirit should take you to the Lord like it did me. Thank God for, a, for a, a guy that had a word of knowledge and a word of wisdom that nobody knew. And I was, he didn't even know I was seeking the real, the supernatural. And he had it. And he was just a normal believer. Not a big, wiggy pastor. You know what I mean? Come on. All right. Let me get, it, let me get through this. You guys are holding me back. Let's see, we got the Sabbath and I'm, I'm profaned among them. Her princes in the midst, or the leaders, governors in their midst, are like wolves, ravening the prey to shed blood and destroy souls and to get dishonest gain. And her prophets have put up with it and daubed them with untempered mortar, seeing vanity and divining lies unto them. Thus saith the Lord God, when the Lord hath not spoken... Shut up if God hasn't said anything to you. Don't go around prophesying. Every day you got a prophecy. I, I, they must be some super prophet. Okay? Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. The Lord told me to tell you this. How often do I do that to you all? Not too often, right? Okay? You know what? They're trying to put a hook in people. We're not here to put hooks in people. We're here to lead people to Jesus Christ and teach you how to walk in the Spirit and learn how to hear God for yourself. You can hear God just as good as I or anybody else if you'll put some effort into your prayers and things. You'll find Him if you seek Him with your whole heart. And the people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and the needy. They have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. And God says, you know what, in spite of all that, I sought for a man among them that, that should make up a hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. God forbid that he doesn't find his people who have the locale down here but are connected to the kingdom of God through our seat with Jesus Christ in heavenly places, far above principalities, mights, and dominion. Would to God that we understood and knew that no matter whether we're extroverts, introverts, have a big standing, have a big following, that when I get down on my knees and I call upon the name of the Lord and from a righteous, sincere heart, 
Pray for my land and pray for the people and pray for my loved ones and pray for my church. Pray for the people in other churches. You know how I pray? I already got the Holy Ghost. I already know about all the gifts of the Spirit. I want the Baptist church over there. I want that pastor to get filled with the Holy Ghost and tell his congregation. You know, we've been wrong in our denomination in that we have uh, let that, that ministry of the Holy Spirit, that part of it, go. That's what I want to see. I want to see in one of those churches in the Methodist or, or, or Episcopalian, the power of God hit somebody and them get saved, get them, get them their, their legs strong and, and healed of some miraculous thing. That's what I want to see. Yeah, I want to see it here too. But man, I, I, I get excited when I hear about a movement of God in a place where they normally don't have it. Not jealous. I get excited about it. People get jealous. You'd be surprised how preachers compete with each other. That's why when people go, do you hang out with so-and-so? I don't know so-and-so. Because the one time that I really hung out with them, I found out how, how competitive they were, how they backbit each other. I'm like, I don't want no part of the organized group of ministers in this town. I'm serious. Now, I know they're not all like that, and, but, but that was my experience. It was like, I'm not competing with these people. I don't need to compete. God told me to do this. This is what I'm doing. Amen? But you know, it kind of soured me towards, let's get together, because every time you do, somebody was sending your people all these things. Come to our church. Come be a part of our church. Trying to steal your sheep. Look at us. We got some cool programs. Well, we'll never get to the cool programs, because you're trying to undermine what we do here. And they're trying to undermine what you do over there. And they're calling, and then, then, and then they're together, and they're all like, Hi, brother so-and-so, how y'all doing, you know? I'm not that kind of person. <laughs> it's just not me. Other people can play the game, but I'm not playing it. I'm here to serve the Lord. I sought for a man among them that they should make up a hedge and stand in the gap before me, that I should not destroy the land. Second Chronicles 7.14 is, is the remedy to avert judgment. If I shut up the heavens and there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among the people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin and heal their land. And when they do that, he says, Now my eyes shall be open and my ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. Stand with me in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. We have a purpose. And we are children of the Most High God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I want you just to close your eyes and thank Him right now. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you've given me a ministry of reconciliation. That you've given me a position in heaven and a locale on this earth so that I can pray your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. Yes. Thank you, Lord, that because I live in America, when all the, the prophets and the, the New Agers and the, the corrupt government officials and people that are doing wrong, and you're thinking, well, I'm going to send judgment, that it can be averted as I, part of the church, would repent of my sins and call upon your name and ask you to heal my land. Lord, I would love to see your grace in this nation for several more years, not so I can be comfortable, but so that people can come to Jesus Christ, so that my family members that are walking contrary right now, that are backslidden, that are not living like they know they should, would get a chance to come back just like you gave me a chance when I backslid. God, save our people. Save our loved ones. Save our land. Lord, if it be thy will, bring in a new uh, government, Lord, that has a heart that's towards you. God, we don't know. We hear them talk. We hear them say this and that just so that they can get votes and things. Uh, and it sounds all good. And then they, then they stab us in the back. You know which ones are right. I want the one you're picking, God. I want your will, not the will of the people. 
And God, now I'm not just talking in the highest office of the land. I'm talking in our localities that we live in right now, our local governments. Lord, I saw in the paper today where Governor Kelly vetoed a bill that would make abortion a little bit harder to get. Where she, she said, no. And, and they're, they're interfering, God, with our children all the time, telling us we can't teach them Christianity and things. And they, then she uses the excuse when she allows uh, the transgender thing to, to be something that parents can just automatically change their little boy into a little girl or vice versa. And she vetoed a bill that, that would be common sense to, to let a kid grow up first before they start whacking and cutting and filling them full of hormones. God, she's not righteous. She's wrong. Yes. And the people that back her are wrong. Yes. And Lord, we just pray that you would remove uh, that person or that you would change your heart. And the people that back her's heart. But if they won't change, we ask you to remove them in Jesus' name. Lord, we're not saying that from a mean spirit, but we're saying it because of, of a righteousness that you've given us. And we have righteous indignation of the things that are going on in our state, the things that are going on in the United States, God. Justice is being perverted. Our DOJ has a double standard. There's evil people putting people in jail for, for years that all they did was go to Washington. Most of them never did even anything. And we got grandmas in jail, Lord, that should be with their grandchildren, all because they wanted to stand up and be patriots. Lord, we don't, we don't cotton to, to people doing destructive things, Lord, but we don't like double standards either. And so, Father, we ask you to forgive us for not praying like we should. We ask you to forgive our our, our country, Lord, for the heinous things they're doing and how they, uh, we, they allow certain governments and certain corporations to manipulate and cause wars. God, we don't know what to do in and of ourselves. We're appealing to you right now in the name of Jesus, God. Help, help our country. Help us as the church. Help us as individual Christians, Lord to bring your will to this earth. Teach us how to pray. Teach us how to come in and go out. Lord, if, if, if Cornelius, a man that wasn't even born again, and, and his prayers came up before your face like a memorial, God, we know our prayers are coming up to you right now, Lord, from a sincere heart. We're, we're, we're anxious, Lord. Many of us are walking around in depression and anxiety, God, because we're seeing the things that are coming on the earth. We know that we have a way of escape through Jesus Christ. But we got friends and family and people that, that have a potential in God that, that are going to miss heaven. Yes, yes. They're going to go through the tribulation and suffer and maybe never find Jesus. God, heal our land. Say that with me. Come on. God, heal our land. Heal our land, God. And help us. Help us, Lord, to be better at the family business that you called us to as reconciliators and ambassadors. We ask this in Jesus' name. And if you're in agreement, say amen. amen. I know that was a little heavy. And I'm not, I'm not coming down on the, on the people of God like that. But, you know, we need to, we need to make sure that we, that we follow the people that really love the Lord and not are in it for money and not are in it for fame. Amen. And just because they can say hallelujah and amen and Jesus loves you doesn't mean they're completely right. See with the eyes of your spirit. Amen. And understand and know, don't make people superstars. You know what? This pulpit is not up here for one of the main reasons. I know I'm small and everything. One of the main reasons is I don't want to be above the people of God because I'm right down here with you. And that's the way Pastor Craig and Nate and I and those that have ministered from this pulpit, that's the way we've always seen it. Yes. And I know it probably don't make a big difference if we were, but I'm just saying for me, I want to be on the same level with the people I serve. Can you say amen? Because we're not better than each other, but we're better together. God bless you. Have a great week. Amen. And pray this week. Pray. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Because 
the Jews right now are wanting to go over and tear everything up in Iran and it's going to escalate. And we might be out of here quick, but there will be people that will be left behind. There will be babies.